welcome to the SPS Digital Learning Hour. Brought to you by the Digital Learning and Assessment Department. We're coming to you from a conference room in Central Office, bringing you the latest news in the Springfield Public Schools in regards to technology, along with inspiring interviews from teachers who are using technology in the classroom. We'll also inform you of the latest updates, practices, and news as it pertains to our district. Whether you are new to using technology in the classroom or are a seasoned vet, we are here to help. Thanks for joining us today. I am your host, Mike Thomas. In case you missed it, the latest blog post is out, and it's all about project, problem, and challenge-based learning. If you've ever heard those terms, you're not quite sure what they mean. This is definitely a post for you. I've made sure that there's lots of good visuals and good definitions of each, and hopefully it can start to prepare us for next year and things that we'd like to do in our classroom, as these are three things that I believe that can help us further the education of the students in our room. If you are confused at what the differences are between the three, that is project-based learning, problem-based learning, and challenge-based learning, go and check out the blog post. It's on the We Learn My SPS page, and it's also in blogs in Brightspace. That's it for In Case You Missed It. Coming up next, Hot Take. So for our hot take this week, we're going to continue in our conversation about using podcasts in the classroom, different listicles, and all sorts of things that are all about podcasting and how they are awesome for your classroom. Since you're already listening to this podcast, we know that you at least, you're at least intrigued by them. And so we hope that you take all the stuff that we've learned and can apply it to your room next year as another option for doing projects in the classroom. So take a listen. In one of the articles, Mike, that we, we read, it talks about how podcasts can improve literacy in the classroom. So obviously, the storytelling was the first thing that came to mind. But I loved all the other points that this uh, classroom teacher brought about. And uh, he is happy to say that it also uh, increases critical thinking skills, listening comprehension. A lot of his students, after participating in podcasts and creating their own, they were engaging in adult conversations with teachers, parents, and administrators who were listening to the same podcast. So I think the benefits just keep going on and on. It had a visible effect on the students' level of engagement and their writing skills. And when this particular teacher started having his kids listen to podcasts, and I think he did have them listen to Serial, he was a little concerned that the traditional reading component was still missing. But then he discovered that if he displayed the text to the podcast, the students wanted that. They would read the podcast as they were listening to it. And that just totally cemented their focusing on what they were learning. You know, I can actually say the, the same thing for my five-year-old at home. Like when we have audiobooks in the house, which we have a lot of because we go to the library quite a bit, like he has the book and he'll listen to it and follow along at the same time. Like that's a skill that we learn at a very young age. And so I think that really does help with the comprehension part because not only are you trying to read it, but if when you're comp- when you're reading something to comprehend and you come across a word that you don't understand how to say it, but you know what it means once you hear it, like that's where this really comes in handy. And it even helps you see like the clues around the word too, especially in a classroom setting where you're like pausing, talking about it or mentioning things like how did the author get to that point with that really hard vocab level tier three vocabulary word? And then you can go back and look at it. Right. And uh, hearing the words helps them this one student in particular, put the visualization in their head. So they're not sitting there struggling on a particular word. They can hear it and visualize, which is very difficult for so many kids. And this teacher said that uh, the kids started to really look forward to these reading events. They were enthusiastic. And he said it's completely changed his classroom for the better. Another one of these articles, because we had a lot of articles that we looked at, There was um, a study that was done, and a few of the results from that study, I think, coincide with the things that the the article you were talking about, which is 
podcast helped grab and maintain the students' attentions. Students conceptually understood content, not just remembering it, but and the scale of understanding seemed to tip toward the podcast. So not only did they understand it, but like they didn't just memorize it. Students who said they weren't motivated at the beginning of the class scored higher on the tests when they listened to the podcast. So this teacher had the podcast like for like after lessons. And so it helped for the students who didn't pay as close attention as we all believe our students do. So let me clarify for that. So that particular podcast was a recording of a lecture that the teacher did? It was a 10-minute version of the lecture. Okay. And some other results that they found interesting, which, again, it's small sample size because it's people, teachers' classroom. In general, no one saw a dramatic uptick in the results with the text or the podcast. If they did the work, they did better on the test, was one of the things. Um, From the beginning of the research to the end, the number of students who preferred podcasts nearly tripled, jumping from 21 to 62, which is quite a bit. And this one I found a little interesting, but I also, again, because it was a smaller study, like the study sample size might not be great enough to make the statistical statement that they're doing. Um, but it said guys improved their results from the pre-test to the post-test more with the po- podcast, but women's results showed no difference. And so, I mean, it was a small sample size again. So it's like, d- can that statistically carry out? Who knows? But for the most part, everybody's understanding of what they were doing in the class improved because of the podcast, mm-hmm. not as a result of other things. Right. And I think it totally um, speaks to the fact that people learn differently. So um, to make podcasts available to your whole class, even if it helps half the class improve, it's worth trying. So with podcasts in the classroom, what are the things that we need to do to prepare students for? We talked a lot about listening, but what about creating? Well, there's a lot involved in that. That will bring me to a different article. (laughs) Um, The one I'm referring to is uh, titled Project Audio, Teaching Students How to Produce Their Own Podcasts. And what I love about it is uh, one of the first things they say is for those teachers who may be technophobes, please don't be intimidated by this technology-dependent lesson. Programs for audio editing are intuitive and easy to use, especially for many students. If you are a novice to audio recording, you may want to attempt to create your own one-minute podcast as a way to experience firsthand what students will encounter during the process. So again, just thinking about, you don't have to create a half-hour podcast or an hour-long podcast. This talks about one-minute podcasts. That's totally doable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also liked the fact that it really sets it up as not a very difficult thing to do overall. For the most part, all laptops have microphones. All laptops have the ability to record what you're saying. Now, if you want to get in more into the production value of it all, that takes a little bit more work, like having particular software like Audacity, which is what we use. Or if you are at school and you have a lot of money to spend, you can get the Adobe package, whatever... Adobe program it is that other people use. The two big ones are Adobe and Audacity. It really sets you up with not trying to make you feel intimidated by doing the process because in the end, really what it is is talking and recording. Exactly. It's that whole growth mindset. It's believing that you can do it. It's not overwhelming. It's not as big and difficult as you think it might be. And I think, Suzanne, that's probably why you're in the position you're in here at Springfield Public Schools with that mindset and attitude. But it's it's so true. Uh, <laughs> you know, I can remember when I recorded in one of my first interviews and I, I tried interviewing on Audacity. You know, within 20 minutes, I felt comfortable with cropping out portions of the interview that had me stumbling or mumbling because I tend to do that a lot. <laughs> um, but having that, that growth mindset is just so essential with any piece of technology, uh, especially with podcasts. And I think our, our students, as we always allude to in our interviews, will probably be the ones who end up picking up and giving us the, the tips and tricks uh, first. Yeah, and they seem to gravitate towards it faster. I know this past week I've spent a few days in the classroom at one of the schools in our district teaching small groups of students how to podcast because that's what they wanted to do for their science presentation. 
was instead of making doing something with Makey Makey or using Scratch, they wanted to do a podcast. And so the teacher was like, I have no, no idea, so I'm going to reach out to you guys. And so I went in for the, over the course of three days, and I kind of showed the ins and outs of like very basic how to do what we're doing right now. And I really stressed with them, it's important to know what you're going to say. So then in the end, you sound confident, you sound like a professional. And then it also makes the editing process easier too. Because what everybody who's listening to us doesn't hear is all the stumbling around that we do when we talk, because I cut all of that out. Which is another great point to make that you can edit out your mistakes. So I know when I've interviewed people, I tell them that right up front. Don't worry if you make mistakes, we can edit them out. So it takes away all that fear. You're not on camera, you're not being videoed. It's a simple conversation and mistakes can be edited. Mm -hmm. I really like the article that we're referencing this New York Times one. They really actually talk about how storytelling is the way, is one of the ways to like really introduce how to do podcasting because you're telling a story. And so you have to focus on the elements of storytelling. And a lot of times with doing that, you're actually covering a lot of the English reading and writing standards at the same time, despite the fact that the tools that you're using are not paper pencil. Right. So I always love it when you're, you're teaching students things that need to be taught, but they don't, they don't even know it. Like they're just mm-hmm. enjoying the whole experience. And then at the end of the lesson, you can say, by the way, <laughs> you have now mastered this long list of standards. Right. And it gets that conceptual understanding that we're always looking for, too. Um, I, Mike, before we um, go too much further down that road, I do want to clarify that there are many different types of podcasts. So we've talked about the storytelling a lot, but it's important, I think, as you introduce podcasts to students to um, explain to them the different types of podcasts and the different objectives. So some podcasts consist largely largely of conversations between the hosts, which is what we're doing now. Others are based on interviews, which we also include in our podcast. Um, Still others involve mostly the storytelling, nonfiction or fiction, and they serve different purposes. So some try to make you laugh, others aim to keep you in suspense, some want to educate or inform. So students should keep all of these possibilities in mind as they consider what they want their original podcast to be like. So depending on what the teacher's objective is, they can hopefully choose what type of podcast they want to do. Right. I feel like we hear um, Paul Foster, our boss, boss talk about this all the time about giving students agency over what tools they use to get to that end result. If the project is you're going to tell me some, teach some aspect of the human body, we'll say. That's the first thing that came to my mind. You're going to teach some aspect of the human body to the rest of us. How you go about doing that is their choice, whether it's writing a paper, making a poster, making a paper mache body parts. I no, I would never do that in my classroom. Just paper mache. Oh, too many nightmares. Or doing a sway, or doing a podcast, or making a video. Like, there's just so many ways to get that information out there. And so, like, this is one of those ways. Which, in all honesty, is like it's a low cost way to like do a project. Like with paper mache, like that's a lot of sweat equity of making the mache part. You can tell I don't do paper mache. <laughs> Um, or with some of the other ones where like you're building models out, like that takes time and you have to have the resources with a podcast. You, if you have a microphone, great. If not talk closely to your computer and you can get it all done. Right. And the other part I like about podcasts is that you may be surprised by some of the students who love this choice of presentation. It may be one of the most introverted people in your classroom, but if they think they're, they're, they have a voice without being seen, they could be a rock star. That's all we need. A classroom full of rock stars. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is just part of the conversation. If you missed the first part, go ahead and listen to last week's podcast. Coming up next is our interview of the week.
instructional coaches. They both work at the Early Education Center. They're, they are Carrie Mancino and Audrey Wolsiak. I totally mispronounced your names, and I'm sure that you will be able to pronounce them better than I will. After listening to the interview, these two ladies are fabulous, and I didn't realize when I went into the interview the depth of pre-K programs that we have in Springfield. So check it out. Mancino. And we are early education coaches with the Springfield Public Schools. We're at the Early Childhood Education Center on Catherine Street here in Springfield. It's a little um, unknown jewel and gem mm-hmm. of the Springfield Public Schools. Mm-hmm. So um, I've been right now, um, I've been in the district for 10 years working with pre-K um, students and now teachers. And I have been in the district for 10 years too. And I spent my first five years doing actually the preschool ABA lab, which was working with students with autism. And then the last five years I did integrated. And this is my second year coaching. And we also work with community programs. So not just Springfield Mm -hmm. Public Schools. We are also coaches for the um, mass reading core literacy tutors. And we work with community programs like Head Start, Square One, YMCA, New Beginnings, Children's Creative. Mm -hmm. New North, Trinity, mm-hmm. so we're really embedded in Springfield. Yes. We wear many hats. Mm. Yes, we do. <laughs> I was going to say, I think you're starting to make up places. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. There's so many it's places. True. No, it's true. It's true. It's true. So yeah. with working in all those places, you guys started 10 years ago. So were you in preschool classes as like classroom teachers at first? Or like, can you talk about that experience? So um, init- yes. So as a classroom teacher for the past 10 years, like I said, half in the ABA lab, half in the integrated pre-K, so I was a classroom teacher for that time. Yep. And me too. I started off in the half-day pre-K, and then I went to a full-day pre-K classroom Mm -hmm. where I stayed for about six or seven Mm -hmm. years, and then I'm now in this role. This is my third year as Mm -hmm. a literacy and curriculum coach for early education. Audrey was the original lone coach (laughs) on this team, so it went from one, just her, and now there's four of us, so it's grown for sure. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, So early on, with working with preschool, what kind of technology would you use? Um, Pretty much in the beginning, just like classroom computers. Then we got iPads that we used with the kids. And then we were pretty lucky at where the school where we were at, where we had a very generous business partner who um, funded the majority of our building's um, smart boards. So then we started, I started using more and more um, activities around the smart board with the kids in the classroom and they loved it yeah and I would say initially starting out I was at um, Sumner Avenue and we had a lot of low tech so it was a lot of like visuals um, and we eventually got um, iPads that they used for like communication and we did different like programs on that and then like I and then when I got to L's um, we were fortunate I actually we also had Elmo an yeah, Elmo, Elmo and a projector mm-hmm. so we would get really creative with doing projecting things at least up even on the stories wall. yeah so we would even mm-hmm. put like the book under the elmo and project the page up on the wall and then like audrey said we were very fortunate that we got um those smart boards because those were amazing mm-hmm. and and i will say too as far as like the district goes and i don't know if i'm jumping ahead but um there's definitely a difference so it's not like across the board where you might see in the upper grades that they get laptops mm-hmm. like in preschool it's very different um, some classrooms have smart boards, some don't, some have Elmo's, some don't. I mean, some have the bare minimum and then some ha- are fortunate enough to have like a smart boards or a bright links board. Right. But yeah. everybody does have an iPad. But, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it's our pre-K is inclusion. Yeah. So right. there's from the SPED department, everybody gets an iPad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what were some of the things that you guys did with the iPads? Cause I'm thinking, I'm thinking of my three year old at home. And when my five year old was a four year old, giving them technology tools like an iPad or a cell phone or a tablet and then doing something on it. One, it makes me a little nervous myself, but yeah. So I, um, the, the district has apps that you can go in and you can download on your iPad. So for me and with the students that I had in my classroom, they were a little bit older, the older preschoolers. And so we did things like the name writing app and we would get the stylus and they would have to use the stylus to like practice writing their name and we were able to record their voices, saying their names so that they could write just not their name, but other kids' names. 
There were also like number and counting things. So they were specific educational activities that we were doing. And then um, there are other apps too, like Audrey was saying, like Springfield, the preschool, we have our own account. So there's one app, it's, it's expensive, but the district um, purchased it. It's the Pro Loco to Go. So it's like actually a communication app. So they kind of use it to communicate their wants and needs. And then we had another, we have another app called um, Pictello. So it's um, in that program, you can take pictures and you re can record your voice, the student's voice. So it helps to make like a social story mm -hmm. or to just document like a field trip. And then that can actually be printed to a PDF and shared with families as well. So those are like the two big apps that I used a lot. Mm -hmm. That sounds awesome, especially for those younger kids. Yeah. Um, just so that our listeners can get an idea, because I don't know how many of them know how many preschools there are in Springfield. Do you guys have a rough idea? Um, I would say there's probably between 55 and 60, including the inclusion classrooms and the, the pre-K links classrooms that are there between full day and part day. Is that is that including... So Montessori, like Karina. Um, no, it, it, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, there's Harina and Montessori mm -hmm. or um, Zanetti. Zanetti, who are Montessori schools. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure how many <laughs> they have because theirs are their program is a little bit different. Yes, right. So yeah, there's a lot yeah. of pre-K. There is a lot of pre-K. Best one in the district. <laughs> <laughs> in that, when you were teaching those are the technology tools that you're using, mm -hmm. now that if we get further on down the road, what are some of the things that you guys are doing right now? Well, we're still using the Elmo and the projectors with our presentations with the, um, when we do professional development and when we do coaching mm -hmm. and we do um, lead teacher meetings with the different cohorts of um, teachers that we work with. We also have utilized um, through the district, we've created a Brightspace page um, as a resource for teachers to be able to access. We have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, for it's a Springfield early literacy PLC page, which a lot of the community, um, people are on there and they post different things. We have a Google drive account where we share documents and things like that with our community people who cannot access mm -hmm. the bright space page. We've also, um, PowerPoint, we've created, mm -hmm. um, modules and videos on that. Skype. We've done Skyping through part of our coaching sessions. We've also used um, our computers and our um, tablets to record teachers in our coaching sessions as part of, um, to use it as a self-reflection tool for teachers to be able to watch themselves in practice. It's different when somebody mm -hmm. tells you something, but when you actually see it yourself and can reflect and go, Ooh, I didn't know I said um <laughs> that many times. Right. Mm -hmm. Is there any, anything else? Well, I'm thinking like SBS specific around August PD, it was this whole we learn focus mm -hmm. on incorporating technology. So we actually trying to think about how can we adapt this to pre-K to make it developmentally, developmentally appropriate. We did board builder. Mm -hmm. um, we did dis a lot through discovery ed and virtual field trips mm -hmm. um, to really think about ways that they can, you know, and they can access this on their laptop if they don't have, um, you know, a smart board or project it through the, mm -hmm. you know, through the on the wall or whatever like that. So, right. and part of the, um, the pre-K curriculum that we have oh, yeah. there, um, for the teachers who, um, create their accounts online, you can access what's called book flicks. Mm -hmm. So some of the stories are actually animated so they can read the book and then they can have an animated story and parents have access to that as well. If, um, if they go online and utilize the username and password to get onto yeah. the website. So, well, and like on Brightspace too, we have links to all these resources because mm -hmm. there's like additional outside of the board builder discovery ad. There's like discovery book. I mean, not just epic book, epic book, which is like digital books online. It's right. free. Mm -hmm. It's like thousands and thousands of books in the library. They can access that. Well, I mean, always YouTube. YouTube yeah. has a gazillion great interactive things that people can can access too. That is quite a lot that <laughs> you guys have I'm going like, on. I don't know if I forgot. Anything. I was gonna say I had no idea like how extensive like. At a pre the preschool programs are really like taking advantage of technology mm -hmm. like with what they're doing um so that's great i'm gonna shift gears for a moment a moment ago we we were estimating there's about 60 ish, school 60-ish yep, yep. schools and programs mm -hmm. there's four of you so how do you guys okay. go about doing a lot of the training okay so do we, you want to go yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in terms of like We've, we've done professional development with the pre-K teachers throughout this year. So we had them for four, three days three in days August, August PD. Yeah. Um, two days were district. And then one day was principal discretion if they want to send people. Mm -hmm. So um, then we did three days 
the three throughout the days throughout the year. We've yeah. also done extended days with Judy Goodwin, the early childhood supervisor. Mm-hmm. So what we we have done in the past is we split people into smaller groups. Um, to and each of us has facilitated a group, but this year we kept everybody together as a whole group. So we had some sessions we had 150 people. And some sessions we had 120 people. So, and it's yes. all pre-K staff and we've, mm-hmm. you know, incorporated, we used, um, we actually at one, at one of our, couple of our trainings, we had two different boards going on. So we projected um, oh, yeah. onto like our PowerPoint, our PowerPoint onto one the, and then the open loop. up another board yeah. to show people actually how to get online and access these mm-hmm. things, like guiding them through. But the but, Wi-Fi is always yeah. a challenge in every <laughs> building. It's a challenge. But, I mean, we were able to tweak it a little bit for the rest of the PD days. So that way we had certain times when people, smaller numbers of people were accessing online. Mm-hmm. But for sure, like, the big a big help was the Brightspace page as mm-hmm. far as communicating out to the teachers, like, different, like, links and resources. And then we also invited the ILSs from the buildings to join. So they were able to share those resources with the teachers. And then the Google Drive for the pe- like community. Audrey for the community base, but then also through the Facebook page, we would um, send invitations to different literacy nights that um, PLCs that we had here at the ECEC. Um, originally, we used to do them once a month, and now they're kind of every other month. I think we we try to reach them as much as we can through that, so at least it's a, some type of support that they can access at any time. <laughs> it's a lot going on. <laughs> Yeah. The reason why, like, I reached out to you guys to interview was because I helped put one of your PowerPoints to a video. Can you guys talk about, like, the whole process that it took to, like, create that, go through okay. that, why you decided to, like, make, turn that into a yes. video itself? So Audrey originally started the work with Kate coaching last year. They created these modules for the community-based organizations around different things. Kindergarten for readiness. Yes. Mm-hmm. Topics. So it actually, the work was started even prior to that, where we had a committee of kindergarten, pre-K, and first grade teachers who all were um, Mm -hmm. committed to early childhood. And so we broke down into smaller groups and each group worked on a different module. And then from that, Laura Menz had the idea to like, let's create them into this, you know, more interactive way. And Carrie and Kate Asher actually went last year and presented a live version of it (laughs) to... um, kindergarten readiness committee yep here in, in springfield and then um came the davis foundation through the davis yep. foundation and then came back with well let's make it into a module where we can send it out to programs in the community where they can't always send their staff out to come to trainings because of coverage mm-hmm. so um we decided to so originally i think we wanted to like videotape ourselves almost yeah. like present almost it. like a web not yeah. even like a webinar, almost like a presentation, but we thought that would be like, I don't know, just like not natural right. to like videotape in an empty boardroom or something. <laughs> so then we got inspired by like webinars and online trainings and we're like, you know what? We should create our own like webinar. Like how could we do this? So we were playing like different apps. I know Kate was like, try it through was it stream movie maker. or movie maker or yeah, something. <laughs> and then we, we were like, you know what? PowerPoint was the way to go and we figured it out. And I mean, it mm-hmm. took a long time. <laughs> For sure. It really did. A lot of takes. Yes. And, um, like do-overs because you get <laughs> yes. to the last word and then you're like, oh, I said the wrong thing. Yeah. But, sure. And then we tried to input our personality too because what you see in there, that's kind of how we are when you get the live version yes. too. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. but yeah. yeah. And then, um, and then I recently, Kate showed me, showed me how you showed her to mm-hmm. switch it to a, a oh. video. So I put it on our Facebook page as well for people to see. Yeah, because it looked like you guys spent a lot of time and put a lot of effort into making that a great tool to use. Mm -hmm. So for our listeners who don't know, there is a video on Microsoft Stream in the Early Literacy channel, Mm -hmm. and that's where we had put the video, and future videos will also go there because I know... After talking with Kate, she was like, oh, this is great. We should do more. So I don't know if you guys knew that, but yeah, I definitely knew that. More. We know two two more. more. We'll be looking forward to seeing that and also like seeing the things that you guys are doing. You guys are using technology and like I come from a fifth grade background, so I don't really see the preschool. Yeah. Just like the school I was at didn't have preschool. Mm-hmm. So for me, this has been eye opening and I imagine it will be for a lot of our listeners. So the last question I usually like to end on is if every year at the beginning of the school year, the week before August PD, Mm -hmm. all the new hires have to go through a week of new hire PD. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's actually called, but I'm just going to call it new hire PD. 
Um, if you had the chance to stand in front of them and give any advice, whether it's technology based or not, what would you say? As a pre-K teacher giving advice to like a new pre-K teacher, I feel like the most important thing for me is kind of establishing that environment and you want it to be a positive environment, you know, how you interact with the students, like the language that you use, but also kind of making it a safe place for them, establishing those routines and you know, those procedures right off the bat to kind of create that foundation for everything Mm -hmm. else. So I think for me, that would be the most important thing. I would say have a backup plan in case you have technology incorporated into your lessons because we constantly... Especially when we're presenting in yes. front of big groups, what it is. Maybe have we can issues. Ask Michael, Michael, about this. Yes. <laughs> um, like the other two days ago, we were doing a presentation, and the Elmo wouldn't. We couldn't get the Elmo to work, and we're like, "Why?" And then we had a problem with the, um, with the projection of our PowerPoint. Yes. So we're like, "Have have a backup plan just in case," because that's that's kind of what we always do. We'll have this computer set up and projecting, and we'll have our backup computer over here with the screen on, just in case we need to unplug and replug the other one back in. And yeah, you know, so yeah. just have a backup plan. Technology is great, but <laughs> still yeah. has hiccups sometimes. Yeah, but it does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to thank you guys again for taking time to meet with us, and I know I learned a lot, and I'm hoping our listeners did too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. ladies and I had a great time sitting down and chatting with them. I hope that you guys learned a lot about the things that are going on in pre-k. So this is stuff even before kindergarten, uh, before they come to you in kindergarten and through on that we are doing in this district and how they are utilizing not just Brightspace but the smart boards and the Elmo document cameras and even social media to get the community involved in everything that they are doing. I hope you learned a lot. As always, there are many ways to listen to us. I hope that you have found your favorite. If you have, please like us that way. Um, So it lets us know that, one, where you're listening to us, because the data we have shows that we're listening all over the place. But we'd like to know who is listening where. So if you want, you can drop us a line. We have a Yammer group set up. You can email us at DLA support. There are many ways to get a hold of us. There's many ways to listen. As we are coming to the end of the school year, we've only got a couple more podcast episodes left. I hope that you guys have been learning a lot this school year as we have enjoyed getting out there talking with teachers and just learning ourselves. As part of We Learn, we are all constantly learning. And with that, I am Mike Thomas, and I will see you next week.